Good morning, church. Welcome to Laporte United Methodist Church, whether you're here in the sanctuary or out there in TV land. We're glad that you are with us. Uh, a couple of announcements that I have this morning are the Clothe the Kid is a different way of doing the Clothe the Kid this year. We are accepting monetary donations this year, and you may donate through August 14th and make your check payable to the church and mark it Clothe the Kid in the memo area so that we know that it goes to the right location. If you have any questions, you can see my wife, Cheryl, wherever she may be. Uh, the next fellowship activity is this Wednesday at 12 o'clock. We'll be having a taco bar and ice cream sundaes along with the viewing of uh, The Chosen Season 1, Episode 6. If you were planning on attending, we would like to have you sign up so that we have an idea of how much food to prepare. And here we go again with more food. Next Sunday, uh, after church, there will be a faith and fellowship gathering. In the fellowship hall, you are asked to bring a side dish in your own table service. Thank you. Thank you, Marilyn. If you are able, would you please stand and join me in the call to worship? Often we find ourselves in the wilderness. Often we wait in the wilderness. When in the wilderness, we have hope. While we wait in the wilderness, we have hope in his promise of rescue. God delivers from the wilderness. When God delivers from the wilderness, he restores us and makes us whole. He makes us new and better than before. We come today to worship a God of deliverance and salvation. Amen. Will you take a moment now to greet one another in the name of Christ?
Okay, if we could get back to our seats and join in singing our first hymn. Marilyn's over here. <laughs> Join me in an attitude of prayer this morning. Heavenly and gracious Father, we thank you for the opportunity and the gathering here this morning to worship and to praise you. There are many people in the wilderness, Lord, and we ask that you be with them to help them to get through their wilderness. We know that you are there with them, but they need to know you are there. We don't want them to go through the wilderness alone. So we thank you for this day and the words and the songs that we hear today and help us to put to use the way in which that glorifies you. These things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs> First scripture lesson this morning is taken from the book of Exodus. <clears throat> Who is like thee, O Lord, among the gods? Who is like thee, majestic in holiness, terrible in glorious deeds, doing wonders? Thou didst stretch out thy right hand, the earth swallowed them. Thou hast led in thy steadfast love the people whom thou hast redeemed. Thou hast guided them by the strength to thy holy abode. The peoples have heard, they tremble. Pangs have seized on their inhabitants of Philistia. Now are the chiefs of Edom dismayed, the leaders of Moab. Trembling seizes them all. All the inhabitants of Canaan have melted away. Terror and dread fall upon them because of thy greatness of thy arm. They are as still as a stone till thy people, O Lord, pass by, till the people pass by whom thou hast purchased. Thou wilt bring them in and plant them on thy own mountain, the place, O Lord, which thou hast made for thy abode, the sanctuary, O Lord, which thy hands have established. The Lord will reign forever and ever. For when the horses of Pharaoh and his chariots and his horsemen went into the sea, the Lord brought back the waters of the sea upon them. But the people of Israel walked on dry ground in the midst of the sea. Then Miriam the prophetess, the sister of Aaron, took a timbrel in her hand, and all the women went out after her with timbrels and dancing. And Miriam sang to them, Sing to the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. The horse and his rider he has thrown into the sea. Then Moses led onward from the Red Sea, and they went into the wilderness of Shur. 
they went three days in the wilderness and found no water. When they came to Marah, they could not drink the water of Marah because it was bitter. Therefore, it was named Marah. And the people murmured against Moses, saying, What shall we drink? And he cried to the Lord, and the Lord showed him a tree, and he threw it into the water, and the water became sweet. There the Lord made for them a statute and an ordinance, and there he proved them, saying, If you will diligently hearken to the voice of your Lord, your God, and do that which is right in his eyes, and give heed to his commandments, and keep all his statutes, I will put none of the diseases upon you which I put upon the Egyptians, for I am the Lord, your healer. Then they came to Elam, where there were twelve springs of water and seventy palms, and they encamped there by the water. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. At this time, I invite the ushers to come forward to receive our morning tithes and offerings. hungered, he knew from where his sustenance came. One does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Lord, from the abundance of your grace, your word has provided all that we need. All that we have is yours. Receive the offering of our hands and the gratitude of our hearts. In the name of your Savior, we pray. Amen. Join in singing our next hymn, Take Time to Be Holy.
United. Welcome to Laporte United Methodist Church. Now you can hear me. But I am glad that you are here. And I am glad that we are here in the presence of God to be together to sing praises to God, to hear God's word, and to approach God with our prayers and our petitions. I have a couple of prayer requests for us this morning um, from Victoria Jackson uh, to remember her at her job that she's worked at for five years and whatever needs are there. Alfred Zellner um, had, a, had a fall this week but is doing okay, so let's remember uh, those two prayer requests. Let's also remember those on our prayer list, um, Denise Berkey and Paulette Hazlett who had uh, procedures and are doing okay, Jeannie Oppinger who had uh, finally had her back surgery last week, but is still in the hospital due to some complications and hoping to go to rehab sometime tomorrow or Tuesday. So let's remember them. Uh, we have Karen Ely with us today, so she's up and about, so good to see her about, but remember her and her prayer and your prayers and, um, and all the others that you see listed on our prayer list, so let's remember them. Uh, Art Smith, let's remember him. Let's remember Al Gilder as he continues to recover. Um, um, and just, like I said, all the ones that you see listed on the list. Are there any spoken prayer requests that anyone would like to share this morning or praises? Yeah, Stacy. Thomas would like to thank everybody for all So we're praising that Thomas had a birthday and he would like to say thank you. How old is Thomas? Nine. Nine. Wow. It just seems like yesterday, right? <laughs> just seems like yesterday. Um, Amen. So, my friends, let's, uh, yes, Wes. Oh, uh, Mary and I celebrated our 48th wedding anniversary on Tuesday. Oh, that's right. Mary and Wes married 48 years. Oh, he said, extremely wonderful years. <laughs> also, uh, yesterday, the Brisbane's uh, celebrated in, in a, re a recommittal service, a renewal of their vow service, their 50th wedding anniversary, which was Friday. So congratulations to them also. Um, so, My friends, let's go before God in prayer. Now, gracious and heavenly Father, we thank you for this beautiful day that you've given us, for the reality that we get to come together as your people, as those that are redeemed by us, the saving grace of Jesus Christ, that you loved us so much that you gave yourself for us. What greater gift, what greater expression of love that a God, the God, would give himself for us. So, Father, we are thankful for that expression of love towards us. But also that that love continues. That love continues uh, thousands of years later uh, since Christ has been on earth. And his actions show just how deeply in love with us you are. Now, Father, to this day, your Holy Spirit guides us into that reality that you still love us, that you are still here to guide us, so that we may have fruitful and productive lives on this earth. But our happiness, our contentment, our answers don't come from this earth. They come from you, the God in heaven. And that's why we are here today. You bring those uh, prayer requests that were mentioned before you, Father. Those that were not mentioned, those that were quiet in our hearts, we bring those to you also. We bring those names of people listed on our bulletin and the needs in their lives, Father. Those that have had procedures that they will have quick healing. Those whose bodies are aching and just need answers, Father, we pray that answers come. Those with diagnoses that are hard, Father, give them what we talked about last week, the peace of Christ that doesn't come by human understanding. Father, those prayer requests in our prayer box, you, you know the things on people's hearts that were so dear to them that they would include them there. Father, my words could go on, but the intention is this, that we bring everything to our God that loves us so much. So in these things we pray, in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, amen. My friends, would you recite the Lord's Prayer with me? Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, 
and forgive us trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. This morning, friends, we have a couple of special guests with us. As you know, over the last a few weeks, um, quite a few weeks, we have been working with uh, a young couple, uh, Oleg and Valentina, who have come to the U.S. from um, Ukraine, and they have sought refuge in our country. And you have been helping them with your prayers and, and in other ways, and we have some couples in the church that have been working uh, intensely with them. And I'd like for them to stand today where they are, just so you can see them and, um, and welcome them. <laughs> they are, um, thank you. They are very grateful for the love and support that this congregation has shown them, and uh, I'm sure will continue to show them in the future. Uh, my friends, this is a living representation of doing the good deed that we're called to, for making disciples of Christ, to love other people as we would love ourselves. And I would hope that if we were in a dire situation, that someone would reach out to us. So thank you very much for doing that, and thank you for coming today so um, our congregation could see you, and you folks are in our prayers and will continue to be so. Last week, we diverged away from our um, sermon series through the book of Philippians. And I did so because I just felt like we were burdened down a little bit, that we're just overwhelmed between uh, the things of pandemic, the things of, uh, that are going on in our denomination, and the things that are going on in our lives. And you know what those are for me personally. But I felt, you know, we needed to be reminded of who we are. We need to be reminded that God has never left us, that God has never forsaken us. So last week we talked about peace, that peace that uh, Christ gives us, and he said the Holy Spirit would come to fulfill that, that our hearts would not hurt, that our minds would not be weary. So we continue that, that theme again this week, and we'll continue it again next week, and then we'll be back on track with our previous sermon series. So this week we're talking about the wilderness experience, and our second scripture reading is Matthew chapter 4, verses 1 through 11. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And he fasted forty days and forty nights, and afterward he was hungry. And the tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. But he answered, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He will give angels charge of you. And on their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. Jesus said to him, Again, it is written, You shall not tempt the Lord your God. Again, the devil took him to a very high Place and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them. And he said to him, All of these I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, Be gone, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. Then the devil left him, and behold, angels came and ministered to him. Now this message that we're going to hear today... Uh, it can be a little tough to take. Uh, not because it's mean or it's spiteful, but uh, sometimes the word, the reality of the word is a little hard to take. But the simple matter of the fact is we need the hard times that we go through. We need the wilderness experiences that we go through. What do we think of when we think of the wilderness? We think of nothing. There's nothing in the wilderness. But there's a reason that God allows or God takes us into these wilderness seasons in our life. And these reasons are vital for our future to accept the destiny that God is calling us into. 
So when you think of a place that you consider the promised land, and as soon as I said the word, I imagine that things have started to pop into your head. Maybe a, maybe a nice, warm, sandy beach, a comfortable hotel room, sitting by a mountain stream, a place that is peaceful and quiet, a place that has all the niceties of life. Well, today we're going to talk about the exact opposite of that. So I built you up. Now I got you there, right? So the Israelites were walking into this. Look at this. I mean, does that look like a place you want? I guess it doesn't show in there. Does that look like a great place to go to? I mean, when I think of vacation, that's it. What about you guys? No, right? But that, that's what they, the Israelites were walking into. Uh, they were leaving Egypt, walking into this, so to speak. And I don't imagine that that would be any of your top ten vacation destination spots. But what is wilderness? Let's see if we can work up a definition for wilderness. Wilderness is an unsettled, uncultivated region, a large tract of land covered with dense vegetation or forest, an extensive area, such as a desert or an ocean, that is barren or empty, a waste. And God was leading them, leading the Israelites there for a very specific person, a reason, purpose, excuse me. They weren't just going through there to get from point A to point B. There was something that had to happen in that place, in that barren, dry place. This time was going to be a challenging time for Moses and for this huge mass of people. But what God was doing is God was instilling some principles in their lives that they were going to need when they, get, when they would get to their promised land or when they would get to their destiny that was promised to them. So while we may not like the truth of this message, this, again, the simple fact of the matter is that wherever we are, the wilderness experience is needed. So what is in the wilderness? Nothing. Why would God send us to a place where there's nothing? And there's a reason God takes us to these places or allows us to go to these places. Again, because it is vital to what he's going to do with us later. Think about it this way. God frees. God makes some big movement. And then there's a time of testing. And then there's a purpose or a destiny. It always happens that way. There's a movement. There's a change. God does something. There's a trial period, a learning period. And then we reach our destiny. So what is gained in the um, wilderness experience? You see here, wilderness experiences test our convictions. You have a conviction, it's easy to have until it's tested. Wilderness experiences grow our faith. They grow our faith. And wilderness experiences make us into warriors. Make us into warriors. So number one, um, Carl, you'll be delighted to know after reading all of those verses that those are our main focus for today. Um, so thank you. So the nation of Israel was setting out to do what? To claim the promise that was made to them hundreds of years ago to their ancestor Abraham. So the years of slavery in Egypt, God was trying to, in this process, uh, remove that idea of the, the servant or slave mentality from them. That's part of what this wilderness experience was for them, this time of growth, this time of change. And this wasn't going to be an easy process, and that becomes very clear, because as we see through their story, that every time they hit a bump in the road, so to speak, um, they sometimes grumble and fail the test, so to speak. Uh, they get tomorrow, the place of bad water. Mm, they're not happy. We just read, or Carl just read, these, these scriptures that talk a lot about God's greatness. And it's easy to think about God's greatness until, until things don't go as planned, and then our human nature takes over, and then we say, well, wait a minute, God. Have you been there? Wait a minute, God. You promised dot, dot, dot. You see, the Israelites found themselves in a theocracy. In other words, a form of government where God is the supreme leader. They're out in the desert, they're out in the wilderness, and they only had God to turn to. 
So they were going to have to learn to turn to God. They were going to have to learn to trust God for everything because they had nothing out in the desert. Not the old rulers, not their own wisdom. Their own wisdom isn't cunning enough to save them. Often God can only make this type of change in our lives as he did for them when we recognize that God is in control. We don't like that very much. We like to think that we are in control of everything. And what they didn't know, but what God did know, was that Elam was right around the corner, the place of 12 fresh springs, but all they could see was the trouble and the fact that they felt that they were left behind. So when you begin this journey of faith, or when you're in this journey of faith, circumstances always arise that are out of our control. It will happen. It's not something that we ever enjoy, and it's, but it is the only way sometime that God can test our convictions. Jesus claims to be all-sufficient and that he will never leave us or forsake us. But the only way to be convinced of that position is when you live through it. It's easy to say God, Jesus is self-sufficient, that he uh, never leaves or forsake us until we felt like he has. Then it tests our convictions. Do we really believe that? Who likes being in that place? No one. But it's critical to go through these experiences to test our convictions. And we can't live this. You know, I can't preach it and you can't testify to it if you haven't lived through it. And that's when things go from our heads to our spiritual heart. When we've lived through it and we know that God is completely sufficient. Number two, wilderness experiences build faith. Exodus 16, 1 through 6. The whole Israelite community set out from Elam and came to the desert of Sin, which is between Elam and Sinai, on the 15th day of the second month after they had come out of Egypt. In the desert, the whole community grumbled against Moses and Aaron. The Israelites said to them, If only we had died by the Lord's hand in Egypt. Then we sat around pots, there we sat around pots of meat and ate all the food we wanted. We have brought us into the desert to starve this entire assembly to death. Then the Lord said to Moses, I will rain down bread from heaven for you. The people are to go out each day and gather enough for that day. This is why I will test them and see whether they will follow my instructions. On the sixth day they are to prepare what they bring in, and that is to be twice as much as they gather on the other days. So Moses and Aaron said to all the Israelites, in the beginning, that it was the Lord who brought you out of Egypt. So as this nation of people moved through the wilderness, they saw some pretty miraculous things begin to happen. They left Elam, and what happens? They become hungry, and they grumble to God once again. And the next day, they received manna and quail from God, falling from the sky to feed over a million people. Uh, no coincidence of a vegetation of a, or a bird here or there, right? A million people. And this for them becomes a daily occurrence. Later they see water coming from a rock as God supplies the needs of the people in the midst of a dry desert. Over and over again, God shows himself to be faithful in the impossible moments, in the impossible circumstances. And he's able to, to sustain them and keep this vast group of people alive. As these things are happening, that less, those lessons are being learned for the purpose of why they're there. God is instilling in them things they need to make it to their promised land, to make it to their destiny. Things like the tabernacle, the Ark of the Covenant, the promise of his continual presence, the laws, authority structures, the Ten Commandments. All of these things are given and learned in their wilderness experience. Think about that. In time of challenge, God builds within us faith. 
within us faith and his ability to do exactly as he has promised, even in our most impossible circumstances. These are the times when we learn about God's perfect timing. That it's not about our agendas and our timelines, but how God chooses to be present with his agenda and his timeline. You see, we gain the beauty of our own stories from his greatness, and then we get to share it with others. You know, the best person to, sh the best person to share a wilderness experience is someone that's been through it. So you, you, you know a person that's going through something that you've been through? You're very apt to help that person. Those are the type of things that we get from this. So as we wait on God, and we don't fall back into our pathways, right? Uh, these, 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 these principles that God is trying to teach us, they're woven into our lives. And they're there. We're learning them because we need them in other seasons of our lives. 2 Thessalonians 3, 3 through 5. But the Lord is faithful, and he will strengthen you and protect you from, all, from the evil one. We have confidence in the Lord that you are doing and will continue to do the things we command. May the Lord direct your hearts into God's love and Christ's perseverance. This is when God sets within our hearts his word. Much like we see in the example of Christ before he went into ministry. God was preparing him for his great work. The Israelites were being prepared for where they were going. We are being prepared for what comes next. You see, your belief will always be stronger coming out of a wilderness than it went in. Have you ever believed in something, in God, or in something, and then you go through the trial and the experience, and you're like, I really believe now. I thought I believed before, but now I truly believe. So the third thing is that the wilderness experience makes us warriors. It makes us warriors. Numbers 14, 20 through 24. Then the Lord said, I have pardoned according to your word, but truly as I lived and as all the earth shall be filled with the glory of the Lord, none of the men who have seen my glory and my signs, which I wrought in Egypt and in the wilderness, and yet have put me to the proof these ten times and have not hearkened to my voice, shall see the land which I swore to give to their fathers, and none of these who despise me shall see it. But my servant Caleb, because he is a different spirit and has followed me fully, I will bring into the land to which he went, and his descendants shall possess it. Wilderness experiences make us warriors. When the Israelites needed to understand that their years spent in the wilderness... They needed to understand that this was a time of preparation. A time to get ready to live into their destiny, the promise that had been made to Abraham. Now they should have been, they should have been people of great conviction. They should have been people of unwavering faith, but they were not. Even after all the things that God had taught them, after all the things that God has shown them, they just were not. But Joshua and Caleb, these two men, full of faith and confidence in God's ability to do anything, were men of great conviction, men of unwavering faith. Do you find it almost unbelievable that they were not able, that the Israelites were not able to have as a whole group, that type of unshakable faith in God. If we judge them by their own account, we would say it's hard to believe. If we judge them by the reality of who we know we are as human beings, we can see it a little bit better. God can show us the most miraculous, wonderful stuff, and still at times we forget that he has supreme power that he has everything in control, that everything is okay when it doesn't seem okay, that everything will be okay, and we'll understand one day. All we have to do is have faith. All they had to do 
was have faith. They had not learned from their years in the wilderness. Sometimes we don't learn from our wilderness experiences. They chose to wander in fear instead of experiencing what God was trying to give them. I pray we don't do that, that we don't do that. You see, God wants us to come out of the wilderness experiences ready to accomplish and receive whatever it is he has for us. And all the things that we are supposed to get, all the things that he is teaching us in these experiences that we have been through, that we are going through, are things that help us be able to take, to take hold, to receive, to live into what he has coming our direction. In other words, his destiny for us. Romans 5, 3 through 5 says it like this that everything happens for a purpose. If we submit to God's direction, we will have overwhelming victory. So in the wilderness, God is concentrating on making you, you, I'm not going to point, I'm going to say you, all of you, God is concentrating on making all of you influencers and his ambassadors. God is making you warriors in the faith so that in turn you can accept your destiny without fear, without disbelief, without thinking the devastating consequences of the wilderness experience disintegrates God's promises. No. They trade it or almost traded the promised land for the desert. We should not. Are we ready to be warriors? So in conclusion, I have these words for you. Those desolate and trying wilderness places, there are places where God uses or puts us Well, we have to go. They test our convictions, friends. They test our convictions. Do we really believe what we say we believe? They build our faith. They build our faith. And in doing so, and proving our convictions, and proving our faith, building our faith, it works to make us warriors. That we know that we can outstand whatever comes in the wilderness experience. You see, the wilderness experience is not where God wants you to stay. It is just for a season. It is just for a time. It will come and it will go. It's a place of necessary preparation. I think we have a lot to unlearn about the way we think about hard times in our lives. I think we need to realize that we can rely on God, that God wants to make us into something new, something stronger, something fearless, that whatever comes our way, we're going to need it. Our world is getting crazy, my friends. We're going to need that faith in God. Don't be the people that want the end product, but don't want to go on the journey to get there. Don't be afraid of the journey. The journey is where you learn. The journey is where you get the things you need to make you stronger. Don't be afraid of the wilderness experience. Don't run away from it. Don't try to disengage from it. I encourage you this morning to stay the course. If you're experiencing one of those wilderness experiences today, At this time in your life, where you feel like everything is a struggle, and that you're not enjoying anything that God has promised us, don't worry. Because if you are, it tells us one thing. God is working to prepare you. God is working to prepare you for something. Don't abandon God's plan for you. You have not been forgotten, people. You have not been forgotten. God is testing, or God is allowing your convictions to be tested. Do you really trust him? 
Do you really trust him? God is building your faith through this experience. Do you believe that he will come through on his promises? Will he take you to that place that you've been promised? God is making you warriors. Warriors this morning, my friends. He is growing your character. He is growing your endurance, your perseverance. Don't resist the wilderness experience. Walk through it. Embrace it. And let God teach you in it what he seeks to teach you in it. Amen. If you will join me this morning, we're having Holy Communion. Turn to page 12 of your hymnal, or you can read off the screen. As we prepare for communion this morning, I'd like uh, to remind you that the Methodist Church observes an open table. And what that means is that if you have a relationship with Christ, uh, you are welcome to Christ's table. It is not ours, it is his. This is his table. We just are welcome to his table, to experience God to get today live in this church. Christ our Lord invites you to the table, all who love him, who earnestly repent of their sin and seek to live in peace with one another. Therefore, let us confess our sin before God and one another. Hear the good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. This proves God's love toward us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. Lift up your mouth, Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy are you, and blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took the bread, gave thanks to you, and broke the bread. He gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks to you, and gave it to his disciples and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant. Pour it out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in these mighty acts, in remembrance of those, and so in remembrance of those, of these your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and the blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world, until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. 
through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit and your Holy Church, all honor, all honor and glory is yours, Father Almighty, now and forever. I invite you to come forward.
My friends, would you stand together as we sing our last hymn, uh, All Creatures of Our God and King. folks sound good. Yeah. Praise God. Uh, was something missing today? Matthew 4, 1 through 11. Guess what? That's the last sermon in the sermon series, which is next week. But it applies to today. So come back next week as we finish up um, this experience through the wilderness experience. Would you pray with me? Gracious God, again, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your word that you give us. We thank you for the opportunity to hear your word speaking. And gracious God, we thank you ever so much for the voices that were lift high today, that sing your praises, the sing about your majesty, about your purpose, about your creation. Father, help us in this week and in the times to come to realize that wilderness, as bad as it is, serves a purpose. It serves a purpose. Help us to live in to those purposes. Help us to, to gain from the tough times the things that you would have us learn, that we may be more apt, better prepared, stronger warriors for the faith. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.